part 12, Metaphysical Meaning of Ancient Mythologies. The new wave of metaphysical, cosmological and physiological inquiry, which started in the 6th century BC among philosophers and sophists, at first there was no real difference between them, strengthened the intriguing opinion that the myths and hieratic accounts were unable to deal with reality without introducing certain facial distortions and deformations. Being unable to understand the deeper symbolic meaning of ancient mythologies, or to put the acquired fragments of the European and Mesopotamian wisdom into an integral and meaningful unity, they turned against their own lavish poetic tradition, also regarded at its face value, and argued for the need of a pure scientific theology and for a genuine worship of the invisible principles based on a proper comprehension of the divine order. So it seems that irrational and often scandalous myths must be neglected in favour of the semi-esoteric logos, which belongs to a few specialists in scientific knowledge. However it may be that, as the remark made by Socrates at the end of Plato's Theotetus suggests, knowledge as a rational account, logos, is also unattainable. Socrates says to Theotetus, the young pupil of the distinguished mathematician Theodorus, So, Theotetus, neither perception nor true belief, nor the addition of an account to true belief, can be knowledge. But, as a sequence of dialectical scrutiny, even if, even if Theotetus remains barren, he cannot any more fancy he knows what he does not know. Quote, for that, and no more, is all that my art can effect. For have I any of that knowledge possessed by all the great and admirable men of our own day or of the past? But this midwife's art is a gift from heaven. My mother had it for women, and I for young men of a generous spirit, and for all whom beauty dwells. End quote. Though Rosemary Desjardin suggests that Theotetus's amazement is philosophical wonder, because such reflection opens him up to the philosophical issues, in searching for a solution to problems of irrationality, the incompatibility of incommensurables, one may suspect that this feeling of wonder, to thaumatsein, which shows that you are a philosopher, is really a wonder induced by facing the mystery of the divine intelligence and the ineffable waters. Accordingly, quote-unquote, true knowledge is not a property of human beings as mortals, be they scientists or rationalists, and cannot be acquired by discursive thought because it concerns the intelligible realm and objects of the divine order, which can only be grasped by the transformed soul through noetic insight and apoptic vision akin to revelation or mystical union with the divine. Reader's note, I think apoptic there means the highest grade of the Eleusinian mysteries. Anyway, onwards. Contrary to the ancient traditions of wisdom, many contemporary thinkers in their unending quest for certainty turn not to the sacred truths, revelations and symbols which lead to integral piety, illumination and inner vision, but to trivialized mathematics and epistemology which cannot transcend the realm of discursive reasoning and secular pragmatism. Therefore the main area of philosophy, by this time meaning in academic discourse, is that of epistemology, the pursuit of scientia instead of sapientia, turning out to be a major pastime for the modern philosophers who, quote, regard Plato's Theotetus, perhaps along with the Meno, and Sextus Empiricus's outlines of Pyrrhonism, as containing the primal sacred doctrines, disoi logoi, revered by the devotees of modern epistemology. End quote. 
This rather ironical remark, made by Daryl L. Hale, is aimed at the endemic failure of contemporary thinkers to distinguish between knowledge and wisdom. They take their only task to be that of elucidating the conditions of human knowledge, classifying countless opinions and instigating sceptical attacks on those who disagree with their premises, based on barren, secular rationalism and humanism. Seeing from this special standpoint, the earliest Greek philosophers, starting with Thales, divorced philosophy from mythology, poetry and traditional genealogies. Since, quote, reason sought and found truth that was universal, unquote, the earlier age of quote-unquote mythology and superstition was replaced by the age of science, according to F.M. Cornford. This discovery of nature is accompanied by the tacit denial of the distinction between experience and revelation. Quote, the conception of nature is extended to incorporate what has been the domain of the supernatural. The supernatural, as fashioned by mythology, simply disappears, and all that really exists is natural. At present, we are not so sure about such straightforward conclusions. Oh, end quote. At present we are not so sure about such straightforward conclusions, and even if the essence of Ionian philosophy and science, which is credited with denying the spiritual as distinct from the material, is not misconceived and misunderstood, i.e. if Thales really introduced something new, the so-called Western science, as the pursuit of knowledge for its own sake, nevertheless this idea of the crucial turning point is fabricated, and maintained with some infantile enthusiasm and magic hyperbolism. According to René Guénon, in the 6th century BC, commonly viewed as the starting point of classical civilization, something of which there had been no previous example appeared. The special form of thought which acquired and retained the name of philosophy. Guénon recognizes that this word can be regarded in a quite legitimate sense, because it is simply an initial disposition required for the attainment of wisdom. Only the perversions which substitute philosophy for wisdom, taking the transitional stage for the end itself, and introducing a pretended wisdom which is purely human, and entirely of the rational order, should be neglected. However, Gwenon follows too closely the assumptions of those whom he is ready to criticise, thus assuming that philosophia really begins with Thales. It is more likely that Thales simply readapted and reinterpreted, perhaps in a one-sided fashion, some aspects of the Egyptian Mera Reku, the love of knowledge, striving for wisdom, i.e. philosophy in its etymological and anagogic sense, whose archetypal guide and divine patron was Thoth, or Jehuti. This divine scribe and demiurgic logos, the heart and tongue of Ra, himself represents and embodies the beginning, the middle and the end of the way towards the noetic identity of Ba, the winged soul, since every wise man ultimately is united with Thoth and his energies. The Neo-Pythagoreans and Middle Platonists inherited and accepted the tradition which presented Plato as a disciple of Hermes Trismegistus. That means, not as a historical person, but as an archetype, which stands for all wisdom preserved and practiced in the Thothian houses of life. So if certain Platonic doctrines are the same as those of Hermes, it is obviously because Plato had copied Hermes and not the other way around. As Zosimus of Panopolis asserted in his alchemical work, on apparatus and furnaces, the Egyptian priest Bitus, or Bytos, the thrice great Trismegus, Plato, and the infinitely great Meriomegas, Hermes, are the authors of the mysterious tablet, Pinax, which views Thuthos, or Thoth, as, quote, the first man the interpreter of all that exists and the giver of names to all corporeal things. End quote. It follows that Bittus, Hermes, and Plato stand on the same spiritual level, represent the same tradition, 
and profess the same philosophical and theurgical teachings. Such opinion was firmly maintained by the Hellenized Egyptians and late Hellenic philosophers themselves, hence, according to Proclus, Plato derived some of his doctrines from the Egyptian Hermes, for example, the teaching about matter. Quote, Orpheus produces matter from the first hypostasis of intelligibles. For there perpetual darkness and the infinite subsist. And these indeed subsist there in a way more excellent than the successive orders of being. In matter, however, the unilluminated and the infinite are inherent through indigence and not according to a transcendency but a deficiency of power. Moreover, the tradition of the Egyptians, He ton Iguption Paradosis, asserts the same thing concerning it. For the divine Iamblichus relates that, according to Hermes, materiality is produced from essentiality, ek tes usiotitos ten huloteta paragestai bulatai. It is probable, therefore, that Plato derived from Hermes an opinion of this kind concerning matter. End quote. Since philosophy is a pursuit of bar, inseparable from its destiny, namely, descent and ascent, manifestation and reintegration through the paideia of cosmic life, embodiment and disembodiment, Proclus, in his commentary on Plato's Timaeus, discusses three ochimata, or vehicles of the soul. The first ochima, which is naturally to the soul and puts it inside the manifested reality. <clears throat> and this is a list. Proclus, in his commentary on Plato's Timaeus, discusses three ochimata, or vehicles of the soul. One, the first Akima, which is natural to the soul and puts it inside the manifested reality. Two, the second one, which makes the soul a citizen of the world of becoming. Three, the third one, that is like a shell, and makes the soul an inhabitant of the material world. This division is analogous to the hierarchy of Ark, Ba, and Kart, uh, and Ka of the Egyptians, Ba in a narrow sense of the soul separated from the mortal body, Kart. This division is analogous to the hierarchy of Ark, Ba, and Ka of the Egyptians. In the ontological hierarchy of being and the related esoteric path of ascent, Ka represents the source of a person's vital energy, connected with the ancestral spirits, and the pharaoh whose Ka, as the vital power of Horus, permeates the whole country, and is felt as a presence in every heart. The concept of Ba goes beyond the level of life energy, fertility, and well-being. Ba, the after-death consciousness, also revealed for the initiates, is the soul or manifestation moving between earth and heaven, though its real home is the intelligible realm, cosmos noetos. According to the Old Kingdom sage Ptahotep, quote, the wise feed their bar with what endures, end quote. As the vehicle of ascent, it is depicted as the human-headed falcon, or the Jibido bird. Jibido. The awakening of Ba is a consequence of becoming aware of the physical body as a corpse. That means the soul must be philosophically, through initiation, contemplation and death, separated from the body. With the ascending Ba comes to the place it knows. It does not miss its former path. The realm which Ba moves belongs to Osiris. It is the intermediate mundus imaginalis, duat, the body of Nut Hathor, or the world soul, and the realm of Ark is that of Ra. Therefore Ark means intelligence, spiritual light, the shining one, represented by the crested ibis, the symbol of Thoth. 
the references to the Ark are associated with the soul's homecoming, return to the divine source, the end of philosophical ascent, i.e. reaching the intelligible realm. Hooper Uranios Topos of Plato's Phaedrus. When Ba is transformed and its ascent is accomplished, it becomes an imperishable and immortal Ach, a shining spirit, a star irradiating intelligible light, a son of Ra. Thus the Ach is the Ba divinized, realizing the ultimate precept of self-knowledge, to become like a god. If we compare this teaching with certain passages of Plato's Phaedrus, we should see that one, Ach, or the related body of light, Sa, corresponds to Ochima, for the soul outside the cycles of material existence. Two, Ba, to the winged soul, when it is involved in a series of descents and ascents. Three, Ka, with the vegetative or nutritive soul, which is needed with the higher soul, when the higher soul is actually embodied, and which serves as an intermediary between the immortal immaterial soul and the material mortal body. The upper vehicle is usually called Algoides by the Neoplatonists, and clearly relates the substance this term describes to light though at the same time distinguishes it from light as such. Most of the Neoplatonists regarded light as closest to the immaterial and purely noetic entities. In the De Anima commentary, attributed to Simplicius, we have only one soul vehicle as a single substance described by three terms. Aetherides, ether-like, Algoides, light-like, and pneumaticos, being made of noima. The Alexandrian Neoplatonist Hermias used the term algoides to describe not the soul, but the upper heavens, hupa uranios topos, to which the divinely led procession of the Phaedrus smith aspires. This is the realm of Ahu described as being like light. The procession led by the royal boat of Ra is analogous to that depicted in Plato's Phaedrus. It seems as if the early Hellenic philosophers, or rather physiologists, who encountered traditional Egyptian thought, were somehow unhappy with its symbols and images when they started to search for an unconditioned unifying ground of reality. However, this unifying ground cannot be simply reduced to nature, understood in the banal modern sense. Being the cause of intellect, the first principle ascends the noetic realm of Ra, therefore it is unknown even to the gods and Ahu. It is nowhere, though figuratively described as such names as waters, flood, darkness, chaos. This flood is tantamount to the ineffable substance of the universe that envelop the primordial monad, along with Shu, the begetter to repeated millions out of the flood, out of the waters. Therefore Atum, in the depths of the flood prefigured as Nun Atum, may proclaim as follows. I am the waters, unique, without second. That is where I developed. So the flood is subtracted from me. See, I am the remainder. I am the one who made me. 